thank you, uh, Rhiannon. Thank you, Stacy, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my biggest thanks, however, must be to the two donors who gave the gift of their corneas uh, and transformed my life. I also want to thank my doctor, Dr. Shivi Agrawal, whose patience and knowledge and skill made the difference to the quality of my life. And of course, I need to thank you all here today for through your careful work and dedication have enabled the whole process to work. Like many people, I, in the past, have taken for granted seeing and only fully realized how important it is to, on a whole number of levels when I started losing my sight. Biologically, our eyeballs are a complex and amazingly beautiful arrangement of cells connected to our brains, which allow us to perceive the world in a myriad of ways. Deprived of this ability, the world closes in. Being able to see works at a series of different levels, which enrich, inform, and delight. None of our other senses do quite so much. Memories of what we see provide us with the visual foundation of so many experiences. The births of our children, their graduations, their marriages, their holidays, their lives. Our phones and computers are packed with photographs of where we've been, who we have met, what we have done. We see and record the world as no other generation has been able to. Vital to all this is our eyes. As I emerged from teenage years, I went one summer to a post-impressionist exhibition at the Royal Academy in London. And for the first time, I was blown away visually and emotionally by a Van Gogh painting. Would you believe it? It was of snow. If you looked carefully at each brushstroke, however, it's full of color, though it looked white. From that began a journey where seeing color and understanding its emotional effects was central to my life. It was the beginning of a long journey to London, to Washington, to Melbourne, to Singapore, to Japan, through some of the greatest art galleries in the world. But that moment standing in the Royal Academy in front of Gauguin, a Gauguin painting of Tahiti, the color seared my retinas as no other painting had done before. As I grew up, I became aware of the changes of light from the softness and greens of a British landscape to the sharp Mediterranean light of Marseille after the long journey down the Rhone Valley on the Mistral. Many years later, landing in Thailand on my way to a new job in Singapore, the light was again quite different. And of course, though I appreciated the differences and believed them part of the process of maturation, I just took all these marvels for granted because I could see comfortably. As my eyesight started to deteriorate in the late 50s, and when my optician diagnosed the beginnings of cataracts, I assumed it was just a normal pattern of aging. Though I knew I would not go blind, my vision would be partial, obscured, more difficult the older I became. In 2001, one of the most vivid memories of my father's funeral was his collection of eyeglasses on the shelf in the living room. I was in, even then beginning to put together my own collection, a pair for the car, a pair for reading, bifocals which made me dizzy, the, the old glasses which didn't work too well as the prescriptions changed. Reading has always been at the center of my life since a child. There are no times when I didn't have a book or was reading a newspaper or a magazine. As a teacher, my sight was vital to my earning my living. 
As my sight worsened, I learned how to enlarge the print on my computer. I acquired numerous magnifying glasses. I moved where the light was best. I put stronger light bulbs in. I resigned myself to poor visibility. I gave up driving at night. The situation was becoming more annoying and more challenging, but I figured that, well, it was just part of growing older. In March 2017, my optician, Dr. Kander, fitted a new lens in my left eye. The light became better and brighter. Print was clearer. Dr. Kander told me that the cells in my cornea were not doing their job. Like a good teacher, I gave those cells a good talking to and told them to improve, but it didn't have much effect. The sight in my right eye was getting worse. She kept a careful watch and passed me over to her new assistant, Dr. Agraval, who was already versed in corneal transplants. She explained to me that I was suffering from a condition known as Fuchs dystrophy. I had to go to the computer. Dr. Ernest Fuchs, an Austrian, 1851 to 1930, dystrophy, degeneration of the cells leading to blindness. I learned about the very first attempts to use corneal grafts from deer back in the early part of the 19th century, of the accumulated efforts of countless scientists and doctors who worked over the years to make corneal transplants a possibility. In 1905, Edward Zerm successfully performed the first transplant, and corneal transplants have now become the most successful and commonest form of transplant. Dr. Agraval explained the process carefully to me and the risks. I had no hesitation. As I lay there on the operating table, my head taped down in a happy state of consciousness, watching this blue dye floating like the contents of a lava lamp. I listened to the instructions going on between Dr. Agraval and the nurse as she called for the different needles and instruments. Only later did I dare look at a YouTube video of the operation. I thought I might find it difficult, but watching the corneal tissue unfold after being injected into the eye was like watching a little ballet. When I asked Dr. Agraval about the whirring noise I could hear during the operation, she explained it was the sound of the instrument she used to remove the old cornea. Ten days later, she delicately pulled the stitch out with a pair of tweezers, and the world suddenly looked different. I could see clearly. Colors were brighter. There was a sharpness to everything, which I had long forgotten. Even traffic lights looked excitingly vivid. The cataract and transplant operations were repeated in February of this year. If there's such a thing as being visually reborn, then I am the grateful recipient. The magnifying glasses are in the drawer unused. For the first time in half a century, I don't need glasses to drive. I can now drive comfortably at night. Every morning after logging on to my computer, I can see my email with clarity and sharpness, which had not been there before. It reminds me how lucky I am. And I'm deeply indebted to all of you who work to make this process possible. You have made the difference in my life, and I thank you. The Arizona sunsets are more beautiful. The sky is bluer. The Palo Verde flowers yellower. The cacti in my garden are sharper pink. There is no day that passes when I don't count my blessings. In an age which can all too often be seen as being marred by self-interest and rampant commercialism, where we are pounded day after day by advertisements telling us what we should or should not be buying or owning or consuming. The simple act of one person at the end of their lives giving sight to a stranger must rank as the perfect antidote, the last gift that you can give, and to someone that you will never know. I am humbled and deeply grateful. Thank you all. Bless you, and may your God go with you.